Good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully everything is well on this beautiful and warm, how should I say, Tuesday afternoon. And I hope you guys are experiencing a safe time out there. For those of you on YouTube, thank you so much for joining me here on this wonderful Tech Tuesday, which is well and clo getting close and close to the 200th episode. Big of you guys hitting the ground running saying Iridium Spark Plug's worth it. Absolutely. So, copper plugs have been around for forever, pretty much. And those copper plugs are very cost effective as well. Copper as an element is quite plentiful. Now, the one thing about copper electrodes is that it has a challenge in two functions. One, for the copper electrode to do a good job, the base electrode has to be quite large. And having a large electrode, it does a poor job in allowing for good flame propagation to occur, meaning it shrouds a nice flame from forming when you need combustion to happen. What does that do? It, to some extent, provides an in incomplete combustion, or not as complete as a fine wire electrode. Secondly, copper being a soft metal tends to erode quite a bit, just because of its nature. So what does that mean? If you do a lot of high performance, you're driving for an extended period of time, that copper will erode. As copper erodes, it becomes more and more difficult for the spark to jump from the electrode to the ground strap, and then you start getting misfire and so on and so forth. So even though it's cost effective, it does have its limitations. Iridium, on the other hand, is a very hard substance, and it allows for a very fine tip for the electrode to do its job. So what does that mean? That means that your flame kernel can form very nicely for a more complete combustion, and you don't have to worry about the erosion. I'll give you a perfect example. My drag car, you can't see it, but it's right next to the van back there. My drag car, I used to run coppers because that's all I had access to and it's pretty cost effective and so on and so forth, but I had to switch it every run of the quarter mile because if I didn't, I would misfire. And when I pull it out because of the compression I was running, about 17 to 1, and the type of RPM I was running, the electrodes would kind of wear down and, and round out. When I switched over and upgraded to Iridiums, the NGK ones, I used BKR 90 ixs in my race car. That thing, I could run, not only run after run, but event after event and not have to change my spark plugs. How cool is that? Because of those advantages I mentioned earlier. So I hope that helps. If you had to choose a brand of oil to stick for a lifetime, what would it be and why? These guys. So the Pure Oil that's up there is what I choose. Um, only because they have experience in aerospace. And you say, okay, so what? Well, what that means is that they have experience with conditions that have a lot more heat and friction than we experience in automobiles. Talking to the scientific team there out, you know, they're in the Pacific Northwest, not Pacific Northwest, they're in the Midwest. Talking to them out there in Minnesota, they're telling us that it's crazy what exists commercially in the automotive scene. That the technology that's sold to us at the stores that we go to, the local stores and the Walmarts and the Pep Boys and the Cragens and the Craw or whatever, Shucks, that's really old technology. Stuff from the 90s that they see, they've seen advancements in the past decade in oils, and I guess manufacturers won't do it because it's so expensive. And they also take feedback. So if I say, hey, um, we need a good break in oil because the one doesn't exist, they're willing to make it happen. So they really listen to their, their marketplace. They listen to their customers. So if that's the case, I want to choose an oil from a company that's very forward thinking, that has a lot of experience, and has a compound that's much more superior to everything else out there doesn't break the bank, and also listen to their clients. And that's what Puro offers. So, Sweezy, I hope that answers your question properly. This is the brain. I mean it, guys. The brain of your project. So, what does that mean? Imagine you're working out. You work out, you go to the gym, you're all buff and everything, but then the mind that controls everything is rubbish. I get it. You don't see the ECU. It's hidden under the floorboard, sometimes in the dash, sometimes near the firewall. I get it. You don't see it. It's not pretty. It's not like a wheel or paint or tires. But guys, this is extremely important. This is what controls all ignition, fuel, safety, and cam control parameters in your engine. So you should not skimp on this. This is extremely important. And luckily for us, we have companies like AEM and Haltech that make motorsports grade ECUs at sportsman prices. So that being said, you have many options out there that can allow you to do it. Please don't, no matter what you do, be Malik, don't skimp on your engine management solution. It's extremely important to the success of your project. Yes, there's freeware out there, but you know the challenge with freeware? Freeware, there's no incentive for the manufacturer or the coder to really invest heavily into making it perfect, especially when it comes to fail-safes. Not having fail-safes in an ECU is akin to you trying to do brain surgery with a butter knife. You can do it, 
it won't be very good and your patient wouldn't be as healthy. <laughs> but it can be done, right? Same thing with ECU. So I hope that gives you some insight. Um, K24A2 is the best K24 in stock, says Jim Genghis Khan. So it depends. If in natural aspiration, yes, I completely agree. But if you want to boost, um, you cannot do badly at all with the K24 Z3 or Z7. Because not only does the intake flow more than the A2, it lends itself for a very fast pull because it has this pseudo short runner setup that looks like a very elegant log manifold. You just bolt a turbo there. I mean, I spool T4 72 millimeters to full boost close to 3,800 RPMs based upon that design. So it lends itself very well to turbocharging. But a natural aspiration, yes, by all means. The A2, that's the way to go. Which car do you love the most that you had built and why? Well, Sweezy, um, I would say Initially, it was this center seat right here because it was just the most balanced, the most amazing vehicle I ever had the opportunity to explore. It was something that came up as a concept and it was just so enjoyable. You get into it, you forget yourself, you feel like every car should be this forgiving and balanced. But then something happened um, fairly recently, as of last year, I had the opportunity to build my first electric vehicle and I'm someone who hated electric cars. I really would not do it, drive it, had no interest in them until I saw that my partners in OEMs are going that way and I built my first one and I, I'm screwed. It is the most amazing experience. It's so fast. Have you ever, you know how people go out and they get attention from making noise, like shooting flames and cars loud and blah? Imagine the opposite. You get attention for being too quiet. This thing looks ridiculously. This 935 looks crazy, but as I drive on the streets of LA, people stick their head out the window like, I can't hear, what the hell, what is this? And then I can just take off and it's just, it's, oh my God. So that has been the most, the car that I've loved and experienced to build. And I'm still learning from it. Today I'm going to do some more data logging. I did some updates to my um, AM dash and I'm going to get some more data on my BMS because I want to see if I can push my current limits a little further. So it should be exciting, you know? I would love to see a bzf 20 c swap in NSX. Oh, Honda would kill me. <laughs> it sounds like a really good plan. Good to see you as well, AMG. -da. But Honda, American Honda would kill me if I did that, you know? Oh my God. What's a good five-speed transmission for a sail cam Civic? I have the perfect gearbox for you, Turbo Sicko. And it's one that I use exclusively with a lot of success. You know what it is? the gearbox from the first generation Acura Integra. Yes, the D16A1, which existed from 1986 to 1989, is the gearbox that bolts onto your setup. The only thing you have to do is that you have to, you know the bolt that goes all the way from transmission all the way through the engine? It doesn't have that receptacle in that gearbox. So you have to kind of helicoil one of the holes to hold the starter starter. You can use a regular DC starter, it bolts on, but you, you don't have a provision that goes all the way through, so you have to kind of look all that. And that's it. That gearbox is so robust. I have done, I've run nines on that gearbox with factory gears, with 28 inch slicks, that thing is robust. And why is it so strong? Not only gears are the gears fat and stubby, in between fourth and fifth, there is a handcuff that exists that allows you to have a fifth gear on the outside of the cup for easy changing, but it allows for strength. So you know how some drag cars would take off fifth gear and put a handcuff on it to prevent the gears from, from spreading away and destroying themselves? This has its stock. Stock already. What project should I undertake to start learning EV stuff? Electric bike? That's a good start. But electric bikes can also be as expensive as electric automobiles. So I would say something that's pretty straightforward, something small, lots of fun. That would be good to, to do. So I've seen people do Miatas. I've seen people do full-on vehicles. You want something that can be quite straightforward for you to do. Um, an old Volkswagen would be really cool. Um, bikes are good, but if you're into that, that's a great way to go. But automobile allows you more real estate to play around things and make mistakes, and you have a lot more space to do things and move things around and redo things, which is pretty nice. So I would say an automobile would be a good start if I were in your position, which I was and I did, you know? Randy Levin says, the best engineers can explain challenging subjects to people in people-friendly terms. Yes, you're right. Thank you so much. But I do know very prominent and responsible and respectable engineers who really derive pleasure in making others feel low, <laughs> lower than them. So um, I don't like that. Um, I love, I, I'm, don't get me wrong, Randy Levin. I am down to talk shop with any of my peers. 
but I feel that it, it, it's, it's something that should be done to break engineering down for everyone. Because we all can appreciate science, both scientists and non. Because even the, the media we're using that to communicate was done by engineers. So imagine if you could understand that better. It makes you feel better about yourself and you may come up with concepts. I've had concepts which may have sounded silly to my peer engineers that came to me from laymen, from people who had nothing to do with science. My wife gives me a lot of insight that allows me to do wonderful things. It's really cool, you know? Hey bud, what kind of power numbers in your velocity running? Got a buddy looking to break through in the world's power in his, but stuck at 287, he thinks he's actually talking to you right now. Yes, Veloster N, um, we got it north of 300, but it's very, very challenging. Um, the limitations are twofold. Fuel system is one. And secondly, there are a lot, tons of torque limits in that ECU. The one way to push this power plant to the 400s is to address the fuel system, which is quite limited. And either by adding some type of uh, port injection or by finding, which could be quite expensive, um, a direct injection setup that is a lot more higher flowing to allow us to reach those numbers. Can a pulse chamber exhaust be fitted on a turbo car? Yes, and I've done it. So you guys may have seen my crazy 996 twin turbo with the gold wheels and the gold turbos. That has a pulse chamber. You can use that, and it does a good job in really attenuating on wanted frequencies, especially when turbos tend to drone with a high-flowing exhaust. A good gearbox for K24, asked Philip trailer. You're gonna love this. The Quave Sequential. That thing is bonkers. You can have a bone stock K24, any from, anything from a K24A to a K24Z7, a Z3, K24Z, you name it. It could be bone stock and you bolt on this quick sequential and it just, <laughs> it's like a different car. It's just, it's awesome, right? So I'm smiling because I'm just thinking about driving a quick sequential, which is pretty amazing. So um, here's the thing. You can get a quick sequential about eight, nine grand. Um, it's not as crazy as some other sequentials which can be much more expensive because it utilizes your factory bell housing and Quape supplies a cast end cap and all bespoke gears. And you get to choose from a myriad of gear ratios, so it's pretty good. Slope style design, so much respect for you, BC. You're so humble and blessed, thank you so much. I am blessed, I'm very fortunate to be here with you guys, my family, to be in a country that gave me so much and to also give back as much as I can as well. So thank you so much indeed. Garcia is saying, hello BC, does an engine compression reading vary from sea level compared to 5,000? Yes, it does. The static will remain the same, but the dynamic is different. Primarily because think about what compression is doing, what you're, what's happening in your internal combustion engine. You're ingesting air, all four valves close, I'm making this very, very simplified, and you compress that air fuel mixture and you ignite it. Now at elevation, you can imagine dynamically less oxygen is involved for that compression, hence it's not as dense. So one thing I tend to do, and this is a very nice secret, is when I have races where I have to go in elevation, I tend to run much higher static compression to help my dynamic a little bit better. And I do very clever things with my exhaust systems to allow me to evacuate any rubbish that can exist during overlap. When did you give up street races, asked AJ Thompson. Wow, years ago, I am, um, believe it or not, so I used to live in Gardena. I used to race in Compton, in Silmar, in Ontario, small parts of Wilmington as well. And I came out to Ontario to race and I didn't line up with anyone yet. I was just peeping out the scene, seeing what was going on. I had my CRX, and then I saw a Mustang at an intersection racing an Integra. So the Mustang and the Integra lined up and they went at it. And then as we're getting close to the T intersection, which had an embankment going down at the end, the Integra stopped because the race was over, but the Mustang guy didn't and kept going. And I said to my partner then, hey Xavier, is this guy gonna stop? And you know what, he didn't. The car hit the curb, flew off, went over the embankment. You know, normal street rate fashion, everyone ran over there to take a look. Um, I kind of stayed back and a guy went down the back of me and started yelling, he's dead, and everyone booked out. And that was the last time I ever went to a street. That was it. Um, it was track only for me then because the track has much more safety. If this was a drag strip that he was racing at and lost control, didn't have brakes, he would have went into the sandbank and not over an embankment to a, down a cliff, you know? So um, that was eye-opening. That really changed my mind significantly. And with that, I have to bid you guys good afternoon. But 
Thank you so much for joining me on this wonderful Tech Tuesday. Once again, we talked a lot about oils, we talked about engine management solutions, we talked about street racing, we talked about life, and I appreciate your audience, and I'm here for you guys, just like some people were there for me. Once again, you never know, I am trying to be there and be that person I needed when I was younger. Please do the same thing for, for someone. You never know how you can impact that person's life positively. So by all means, take care. Um, Sweezy, walk around, will come, no problem. In the meantime, have a good afternoon. Stay safe.